So hello everybody, I'm back with another project I thought I'd share with you. I had an acquaintance that um, has a, a street rod. It's a 41 Willys Coupe um, show car. It's got a uh, blown big block Chevy uh, for a power plant and uh, for a carburation sitting on top of the blower, uh, he's got one of these inline carbs, uh, which you all know that I'm kind of uh, familiar with and uh, fond of. So um, he had a uh, adapter between his inline carb and that blower drive service scoop that you see there. And uh, it had a filter in it. He uh, he thought he might uh, be able to do better than that and asked me if I could make a uh, adapter that would be kind of a, a streamlined adapter that would mount to the inline carb um, here through the mounting holes and then adapt to the shape of the underside of the, the blower here and you can see it's basically just um, the basic dual quad setup for centers there are two circular openings um, on uh, eight and five eight centers uh, he's had this piece polished inside now it's a really nice piece so uh, I'll show you a couple pictures um, of the car and then uh, we'll get on with the project and uh, you'll see how we do here in making an adapter for it and Coincidentally, he's got another friend. Um, these are West Coast fellows that uh, also runs an inline carb uh, on a blower and one of them. So I made two. So um, I'll take you through the process. But basically, I wrote a CAD CAM program to cut the adapter that I dreamed up on a CNC router. And then I'll cast them in lost foam like I usually do. So let's get on with it and see how I do. All right, hello everyone. Um, some of you mentioned that you'd like to see um, the CNC machine cutting out some patterns. I think it's kind of like watching paint dry, but uh, I'll show you some excerpts here. But like uh, most things, um, this pattern starts out as a block of foam, and that thing is just taped uh, down to the spoil, bo spoil board there. And then uh, my controller, and then I got a little monitor, which is an old TV that used to be in my kitchen 15 years ago. But um, Anyway, this is how things start out, and uh, I'm about to run a program um, on a uh, scoop adapter that adapts a, a blower drive services um, scoop uh, to an inline auto light carburetor. So stay tuned, and I'll show you some cutting excerpts. Okay, back with you. I uh, sneaked in a tool change on you and uh, did some of the 3D machining there. Um, I figure I'll show you the uh, ball nose 3D machining on the next size. But the uh, kind of nice thing about this program is, is that I never have to um, reset home. It all goes from the same home location. Um, and I only use uh, two bits, um, a quarter inch end mill and a quarter inch ball nose. And then you may have mentioned or noticed that I cut these registration holes in here. Um, before I did anything, I set up and cut the same pegs in. These are just 3 8 dial um, pegs. And I use these 3 quarter inch spacers because the 3 quarter inch fit 
on the foam gives it lots of area and locates it really accurately. It gives me a nice firm fit. Not to mention when I, they slide on and off the, the dowel pegs easy when I'm done. So all I need to do is flip this over and uh, you can see here I had uh, cut out the interior pieces there. They were just held with tabs. They don't need to be there anymore. So I'll tape this down and then just execute the ball nose program um, for the uh, first operation on the second side uh, because uh, I don't even need to do a tool change for that. And then I'll finish up with the uh, with the quarter inch end mill on that. So hold on here and we'll get cutting. And I guess I'll show you some of the uh, 3D cutting excerpts from that. Okay, I made a tool change back to the uh, end mill, quarter inch end mill from the ball nose end mill. And this is pretty much um, the last of the cutting, except I got to do a little round over operation here. But uh, you can see that uh, I've got the program all queued up to launch here and uh, it's going to cut away the majority of the remainder of the stock there. So I'll give you a little bit of more cutting footage on that and then uh, we'll take it from there. All right, the only thing left to do is run the, the round over bit around uh, the segments of the perimeter here, and then I'll, uh, I'll take it off the fixture there and cut it out of there, and we'll take a look at what we've got. Well, some of you have asked about uh, the CNC system that I use. Um, I use this uh, Millwright Mega V. There's nothing super special about it, but it's got a, a work envelope of about three foot by four foot 
by four inches and I think I'm gonna extend the Z axis so um, I get an extra four inches. I'd like eight inches under spindle. I just haven't had the need to do it quite yet. But um, that's the uh, uh, CNC system itself. Um, I use CamBam um, as my uh, cam software, which is pretty darn good value for what it is. I mean, it's not uh, a high-end uh, CAD package, but uh, I'm getting a lot out of it. And uh, a couple other things here. You can see my uh, pedestal that I made. I got an old TV I scavenged from, it's 15 or 20 years old, but it's good enough for um, a nice large monitor um, on that. And uh, the controller is hung on the side of the machine there. It's got a breakout board sitting on top. Um, I put a fair amount of effort into the dust collection system. You can see this dust shoe here, and you might have noticed in the uh, uh, videos, I had the dust shoe set pretty high, and that's because when I'm cutting a pattern like this, um, that's two inches of depth with a two inch bit, um, it's hard to set the, uh, the uh, dust shoe um, at a depth that accommodates everything, because if that dust shoe makes contact with the foam pattern, it forms a vacuum seal, and uh, it can like lift the pattern right off the, the waste board and cause cutting errors on that. So the other alternative is for me to break the uh, program into um, separate bits and reset the dust shoe each time. But I found in the end, it's, it's just not worth it because it only spits a little bit of fluff anyway. And so I just set the shoe at the maximum cut height and just let it go and all that. But the other thing that, um, two other things that I did um, to the dust collection system made this huge difference. You see all the hoses. I minimized the amount of flex hose and uh, welded together uh, some steel duct work um, for the vacuum source because I was chasing EMI gremlins forever. And even though the uh, flexible hose was supposed to be uh, static dissipative, um, the static electricity um, that is generated when you cut foam is enormous. And what I discovered, I think was, is that that static discharge was making my controller, the touchpad on my computer, and anything near it go bonkers. So I took the wire reinforcement in the, uh, in the flexible part of the hose and stripped it and grounded each section of it um, to each metal um, piece in the circuit all the way through the dust collector <clears throat> and then grounded the piss out of everything. I mean, everything that moved on the machine, if I thought it was isolated, I put a ground wire to it and it solved all my problems. So made a big difference. And then the other big upgrade was this little cyclonic uh, dust separator here because um, the dust shoe is so small, it's got, um, it's only about uh, three and a half, four inches in diameter, which is fine for small bits, but the hose is only an inch and a half in diameter. So what you really need is, you really need a fairly high source of vacuum um, to get the flow that you want, as opposed to like a big shop dust collector, which has high flow and not much vacuum. But the big difference that that cyclonic separator made was, I just use a shop vac um, as the vacuum source, even though I have a central uh, dust collector because the shop vac pulls high vacuum. And, uh, but the problem is, is the filter would get plugged with, uh, with the foam in about 10 minutes and stop working. And so I put this little cyclonic separator in there and it takes out, I'll bet you 99% of the dust. And that means that I can run the dust collector basically all day heck, all week and not even have to clean the filter um, on, on the shop vac. So that was a big time savings. And then that yellow box is a little uh, current sensing uh, switch that I plugged the vacuum into because even though um, I can probably turn my router um, on and off with my controller, I just haven't utilized it yet on that. But this is just one of those um, switches that uh, senses when the router turns on, it turns the vacuum on and off for me with the router. So uh, anyway, so that's kind of uh, my system, but I'm getting a lot of mileage out of it and it's fairly bugged out now and uh, I enjoy using it and the results that I get. Hello everyone, since uh, there was some interest in uh, pattern making and uh, how I finished the patterns after they came off the CNC machine. I thought I'd just give you a look at uh, what they look like when they come off the machine and then uh, what they look like after a little bit of finishing. So uh, 
you probably saw from the uh, videos, I have them mounted in, <clears throat> in these plaques. And uh, the uh, perimeter and the, some of the interior features are held in with little tabs. Um, the tabs, you can see, you know, the remnants of them, you know, here on this. I just uh, do a profile cut on those because there's no reason in turning, you know, these entire blocks of foam into chips and, and having the runtime. But after um, the part is uh, finished being machined and removed, I just take a razor knife, cut the perimeter off of it. You can see uh, holding tabs around the perimeter um, of the frame. And I just take a razor knife and cut it out of there. And when I do, it looks like this. And uh, try to show you some close-ups, but just a couple of comments is, is that I've kind of learned that there um, isn't much return in trying to make the machine, machine uh, the CNC machine, machine a perfectly finished pattern for a couple of reasons. One, um, some of the features, particularly if they're 3D features and not 2.5D features, take a lot of time to program to get the last little bit of detail. And I'm going to sand the pattern anyway um, for finishing. So I don't get too concerned about uh, tool marks or little bits because foam is so soft, just a couple of swipes with uh, 222 grit sandpaper and any tool mark um, or imperfection is gone. So a couple examples um, of that is, is you can see um, around the perimeter here, like right here, you see this little ridge? That's just the radius of the tool bit cutting it. And I could have made um, a 3D program that followed the slope uh, and the transition all around and trim that out of there. But literally, if I take this sanding block and swipe it, make two or three swipes on it, it'll be gone. So it just isn't worth my effort um, to do that. Same thing with these little transitions here at the corner. I could have written a little 3D program that ball in milled that perfectly, but I can just take a razor knife um, and then a couple swipes of sandpaper and it's gone. So, you know, when you're only making one pattern or two, it doesn't really pay, um, especially when the material is so soft and so easy to finish, um, like foam, uh, to put all that time and effort uh, into the program. At least for me, um, it doesn't. And a couple of things, though, the 3D surfaces, like these angled surfaces um, and the uh, um, conical surfaces on the top and bottom, they do machine really nice. I have a fine step over on that, and uh, the finish on those is excellent. Um, compared to the finish, like where you've got the bottom of the end mill cutting, you can kind of see the witness marks there. But literally, if I just show you, if I just take this, just that little bit right there, you can probably see the difference in finish right here. And it's a nice finish uh, to cast onto. So that's why I don't put extreme amounts of effort um, into trying to get the as machine pattern perfect. And... Um, this is the, the second one. I actually, um, customers, I have, I have customers with two of these, but just to show you, so here's a pattern that I spent about 20 minutes um, rubbing on with sandpaper. And uh, you can see, I mean, it's pretty smooth. This is only 220 grit sandpaper. On the outside, I'll probably go back over the major surfaces with uh, 320 grit um, sandpaper. But you know, if I hold them up there, I mean, it's not perfectly sanded yet, but another 10 or 15 minutes, and it'd be uh, really good. This uh, pattern here is a pretty nice, gonna make a pretty nice part. Um, and you sort of get the idea here that with a little sanding and finishing, you get a pretty darn nice looking pattern. And of course, uh, the lost foam process, when you coat the pattern, it'll you know, pretty much perfectly reproduce the surface finish on there. So um, I'll have a little bit more on this, but it's kind of convenient to have too, because after I finish the second one up, I'll be able to put runners between the both of them like this and, and cast them both at the same time. And that, that runner that runs down the length of each side um, will also help keep the parts um, flat with respect to one another because you can see right here the gap, that, that board that I machined was perfectly flat, but after you machine all that stock away, um, the foam just relaxes. So I don't get too concerned about that either because I can usually straighten it out when I gate it or I can straighten it out after it's cast and soft. So uh, anyway, um, that's kind of a quick look at the uh, patterns that resulted from that. And uh, I'll uh, finish this one up and stick them together and gate them and we can have a look at it after I do that.
All right, I'm back with you, and I've got the uh, two adapters uh, sprued up and glued together. Um, pretty much the standard fare for me these days, but as I said, I glued them back to back with a runner on each side, and that uh, runner contacts a 3 16 inch width all the way down each part. Um, it's about, each runner's about 5 8 thick, but it's been um, bullnosed out there, so there's a thin contact point that you can see there. I do that mostly just because it makes it easy, easy to degate because I degated on my table saw and it means I have to cut through a thinner chunk of aluminum. It just makes it cut like butter that way is all. And I glued this little piece of uh, wood on the bottom just to handle it with and give it some strength when I'm dipping because I'll dip it this way and I'll dip it that way because the buoyant forces of the foam pattern um, are pretty strong and uh, I don't want to risk breaking the pattern when I dip it. And then the other end, it's just got that little uh, fork that you can see there. I glued a little wooden button on it to handle and dip it with and hang it by um, so it could dry uh, on all that. And uh, I used a uh, hot melt glue um, to glue it together. You got to work kind of fast with that. And this is a really low density um, polystyrene. Um, I like using the low density stuff because it just evaporates so fast the 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 sprue and runner and feed system fills almost instantly and then it kind of feeds the part uniformly uh, down the whole length of it into each part of the part so it's a it's a good system a good way to go and having the two glued together like this give it quite a bit of rigidity and strength for molding so uh, and uh, while I'm at it I usually make some sprue stock because I'll I'll bury it pretty deep and right before I'm ready uh, to um, fill it, I get it filled up to this point, I'll just take some hot melt glue and stick the rest of the sprue on because it's too weak to stick on and handle them together. But <clears throat> this is uh, a pair of them, so they're ready to basically get dipped and get poured. So on to the next step. All right, well, we got a fair weather day, so it's a good casting day. Sun shining, mid-50s, uh, sunny day here in the Midwest. Um, I got the pattern uh, dip-coated, as you can see. Uh, I cut the uh, little wooden support handle off of it. And I cut the button off the top, so uh, it's dipped, dried. I got a little uh, sprue extension here that... Uh, when I mold it, I'll just glue it onto there. And uh, I've got uh, my reusable offset pouring basin um, for this one. And uh, this one uh, has got an inch and a quarter uh, square sprue. Um, I calculated what the poured weight of it would be. Each part um, is just under two pounds. And the whole uh, uh, sprue and runner system is probably about um, three, three pounds. Um, actually, I think each part's about 2.6 pounds. So it was, uh, it calculated out to be about 8.3 pounds and that's a little close for the A10 Crucible. So no reason going through all of this and then pouring short. So I got my A20 in the furnace right now and just turned it on and, uh, I'll probably put about 12 pounds in there just to be sure on that. But, uh, Anyway, she's ready to go. Um, I'll probably just take a couple of pictures of me packing the mold. Um, these are this part's small enough to go in my smaller 12 inch diameter five gallon uh, can flask. So I'll get to doing that. That'll take me about uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so to get that out and get it packed up and vibratory packed and uh, we'll be ready to pour. See you shortly. All right, everybody, the uh, metal's at temperature. It's about uh, 1425F, <laughs> my dog's barking. Um, it's time to pour. So I did the final skim, ready to go.
All right, we'll see how she comes out. All righty, time to see what we've got. All right, it, uh, it looks pretty good. They always do when they first come out of there. I'll uh, get it cooled off and cleaned up and we'll get a closer look at what we've got. All right, everyone, I'm back with you. And uh, in the time since the last video excerpt, I degated them. You can see the, uh, the sprue and the cup and the runners back there behind the parts. Um, not only did I degate them though, but I degated them and I mach finished machined them. So they're all cleaned up and ready to go. And uh, there are a couple of pretty nice parts. I'll tell you what, um, I'd run them. Um, let's take a close look at this one here. Um, you can kind of see the detail. I mean, doggone it, it looks just like that foam pattern. And uh, the finish is pretty decent. You know, it's pretty good as far as sand castings go. It's somewhere probably in between a, a Sand, a really good sand casting and uh, an investment casting, but a pretty smooth finish. If they wanted to polish them, it'd be a good starting point to polish. Um, but they were pretty straight. Um, I didn't, I didn't straighten any of them on that. I just clamped them down to my uh, my mill and uh, buzzed off uh, the remainder of the gate after I'd trimmed the majority of it off uh, with the table saw on that. But they're a light part too. I'd say it's maybe I'll have to weigh them, but a you know, couple pounds maybe um, on that. And uh, besides degating them, all I did was give them uh, a light uh, media blast. So they got kind of a uniform color there. And uh, you can see the second one. The second one's just the same. Um, also a pretty nice part. But the, uh, the real question here is, is um, do they fit? So let's uh, let's have a look at that. Here's the carburetor, and uh, yeah, I'd say that fits pretty nice. Fits the perimeter there. You get a good look at the uh, barrels of the carburetor, the profiles. Looks like it's pretty decent. Looks like uh, what we were expecting there um, on that. And then the other one, um, of course, is that's important is does it fit the scoop? So let's see what we've got there. Here's the, uh, here's the scoop. 
You can see the two scoop openings there and uh, voila, she fits the scoop and uh, the profile there and the scoop looks pretty decent. I'll have to take a picture of it sitting on the carb for you because I can't get the camera oriented for that right now. So I'll take a still and show you that. But the I uh, hit the shrink really, very good. I, I gave myself some tolerance here um, around the the lip um, that it seats on. It seats right on this flat spot uh, surface there. It's got a just a um, normal carburetor gasket uh, on each one. But uh, yeah, fits up there real nice too. I think uh, I think the customer is going to be happy with this part. And then uh, the other thing I did for him is this. Uh, blower drive service part is a really really nice part except here at the interface with the carburetors it looked like somebody had finished it with a snag grinder it was terrible and i put a straight edge on it and there was an eight more than an eighth inch gap when i put a straight edge from here to here so um i kissed the the face of this i got a great big uh oliver disc uh grinder and uh a disc sander and uh I just um, was careful and uh, kissed the face of it. Now it's nice and flat and uh, the entire gasket surface is flat. So he should be able to get a nice, uh, nice seal against that on the uh, carb adapter. So uh, yeah, I'm happy with how this one turned out. Um, it was a pretty short project and uh, I like the looks of it on that. And uh, I'll take a picture of it sitting on the carb um, I don't think I'm going to be able to wait uh, and get a picture of it back on the car before I post the final video, but um, we'll see on that. In, in any case, I could post it up to the uh, uh, www.thehomefoundry.org um, to the casting forum there. I've got a build thread for this sitting there. And uh, a couple other things is uh, any of the equipment that you see me using um, in my videos, there are detailed build threads out there at the the Home Foundry Forum um, for those. Uh, and also, um, if you want to know, a lot of people ask the same questions. I mean, the shrink factor I use for aluminum is 1.3%. That's a 0.013 inches per inch, or simply multiply all your dimensions by 1.013. Um, if you want to know about the foam um, that I use, the the pattern construction methods the refractory coatings you name it surf my channel um there's videos that specifically address all those things so take them in and uh until then i guess we'll see you next time take care